I want you to pretend that you're just, okay, just about ready to come forward. And we go through that process. And I'm going to tell you. And she wraps you up well. And she takes you to a wall. She puts her in the turnstile and brings the middle. And you hear that? So, what well, I can tell you right now. <laughs> Now, when I went to college 
at age 18, I discovered I was going to have to sing at sight. What that means is they put the music in front of you, and you never sing it before, and you sing it. And I wasn't prepared for that, let me tell you. So after considerable trauma, I decided that when I was teaching, people would learn to sing at sight. But I wanted to know how we got to this point in violin teaching, where method book after method book says not a single word about singing. And I have students coming to me and saying, if I wanted to sing, I would have joined the choir. Thanks a lot. So <coughs> the Catholic Church in Venice in the 1300s decided it would establish four orphanages. But they were merely family homes. And these children were abandoned children, very often as babies. However, the church would accept older children. There would be a girls' department and a boys' department. And <coughs> each of them had 6,000 children. Now, what did they do with all of them? Well, the church had enormous properties, it had buildings to maintain, it had fields to till, and it needed a lot of workers. So it was very happy to say, ah, 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 ah. No more babies in the canals. Bring them to the conservatorio. Well, part of the church work was music, because every service needed music. And so, especially at this particular conservatorio, the girls were taught to sing, were taught, were taught to compose, and it was a very broadly based music education, so that they could easily go from singing to any instrument. I mean, the only kept cranking the music out. I think it last count for 200 concertos. He also composed operas, oratorios, whatever you think. Know, he was a very, very busy man. And they had to play new music every week. So that you very good at reading at sight. Now, if you've had music lessons, you know that, generally speaking, sight reading is a thrill. And I'm sure lots and lots of people have instrumental lessons and will never sing a note. Well, it's really not good enough. And it's not very easy to do it when you're 18 after you've been playing for many, many years. So, how did this happen? The older girls at the Baldi's Conservatory would often be the teachers for the younger girls. Eventually, the townspeople started bringing their children into the conservatory to have lessons with the older girls. Not that this wasn't necessarily the beginning of an amateur movement. I mean, probably lots of people who considered themselves cultured wanted to be able to play an instrument. However, it took hold enough for publishers to be interested in publishing how to play the violin. And that's where the rocks sit in. Here's Mr. Geminiani published shortly after the Volga died. Now, he doesn't say sing. Probably his market was gentlemen rather than ladies, and gentlemen would be very happy to leave the singing to the castrati. You don't have to look that one up. <laughs> so this is what a method book would have looked like for me when I was starting to play by the once again. See the numbers. Numbers. We heard the band and Clint painting by numbers. Well, playing by numbers is just about the same thing. What that means is when I look at the phrase, I translate each note into an instruction. 
I made this one bigger because I probably, that was probably the first thing I ever played. This A. That means the A string with no fingers down. An open string as opposed to a stopped string. Oh, I never learned the word stop. So that's how it works. First note. Two. Second finger. Ah, what special second finger instruction on the A string. First finger on the A string. Open A. Walk oh, move to the D string. Third finger. Second finger. First. And finally finishing on the G string. Now, I have a pretty big memory. So, once I played that, I remembered it. But I had to play it before I knew what it sounded like. What does it sound like? It sounds like Great. So here I am at the Eastern School of Music, suffering. And eventually I actually sort of gave it up. I mean, please, I was getting worse. Practicing five hours a day, it's kind of worse and worse. I spent a year kicking around Philadelphia, where I was from. And then I got myself on a bus and played for a teacher who later became famous in spite of me at Indiana University. And after a year there, I went out to play for the orchestra. And I got married. I traveled with a musician who did not have my fault with me. And, of course, I thought. And the secret of that smile is you just look at little girls and you say, Why? And they all laugh. <laughs> there is an ensemble that played here at Eastern that I was there for again. And I also produced, I confess, I was thinking about what would sell. I didn't sell play by numbers, but I also didn't sell singing. I sold technique, which is what we're terribly, terribly fond of as musicians. It's what we do with our hands. And how could it be any other way when that's all we can talk? Finally, 15 years ago, I was teaching in California. I went to a connection with David Gordon. In honor of this speech, I read his autobiography called Music from the Inside Out. I think the secret of everything that he's done is the fact that he was a jazz musician. He played for the, for the double bass with Jimmy Crooker Band. Because jazz is different. Of course, I've, I've seen lots of people break and teach jazz in numbers. So, where did the numbers come from? I, I just don't know. So, he's saying measure potential. No, oh, I have mixed feelings about that. But it's true, I should, as a teacher, have some idea about potential. I guess I think I'm going to get really guessing what it is. Uh, but also, on another level, I actually think that passion is more important than potential. And, and, and actually, I think that's, that's the essential element. I mean, I don't care how much potential, <laughs> I don't care how much potential a child or a person has, and they don't want to do it. Please, let me come here. Um, and his teaching methods that have learned out of his research. People say it's radical. Yes, it is radical. It's very jazz, though, to say that rhythm is movement. It's not. Black spot Tonality. Um, we may have learned about major scales and minor scales, but we probably didn't get into modes, which may have had something to do with what I found so touching in the uh, core work that we heard before. So, how does it work? Well, okay. We teach people to discriminate, to tell the difference between one kind of listening and another, or one kind of singing, or one mode, or another, or one, you know, is it duple or triple rhythm? And then, because we have a vocabulary, which is how we teach this, is with small patterns that gradually become more complex, we are able to infer, in other words, or actually, actually able to say, ah, I know this, and I know that, 
and I can put this part of this together and that part of it. Oh, and one time I can even come up with a new part myself. So we're back to the Baldwin's paradigm where composition is a natural output of learning to be musical. Now, um, I'm just going to go to that one. There's, there's a, some software, very cheap software, which has been developed. But this, what you see on the screen would be a fourth stage. In other words, when you listen, it is like learning language. The baby hears a lot of sound. You know, since we have that on the internet, we can play that for our babies now, right? We don't have to put them in the turnstile. And the next thing is to respond orally. And then we do what's called verbal association, which is do re We refine where what we're seeing totally clicks into a scale. And then we start to make sense of it all, whether it amounts to a major or minor, for instance. And then we learn the symbols. Um, so here we are. He, Gordon is definitely saying, Gordon, Gordon, I had never mentioned that it's just what the ball did, but it is. And it got lost in publishing. It got lost in commercialism. Lots of things do, don't they? I mean, what, how do you sell a by ear when you want you to sell a book? Hold your hands. Okay, so Mr. Gordon is not very hopeful. And I'm not surprised. Because I, I, I've talked to music supervisors who justify putting tapes on the fingerboard of violins by saying this is a visual world. Okay, so how about moving the oral sometimes? How about listening? And then we have our myths. One of the biggest myths is the talent myth. And that's something that Gordon deals with. He does say, he's very like to say we're all the same, or we should all do the same thing. He's certainly saying that teachers should know what they're doing. But he's saying that Yes, there's a bell curve. All right, I've been divulged. I'm somewhere in the world. And to a large extent, everything that he's telling us to teach has to do with this bulge. But we do need to know what somebody's in this 5 to 10 percent up here that's what we call, you know, musical genius, or somebody who's down this 5 to 10 percent down here who's going to be struggling. But in general, you, I think you probably know very well that what's happening in our schools is not serving the bulge. We're acting as though if you're not in that high end, you're not really worthy of becoming someone who's fulfilled their potential as a musician. So that's what I want to see change. I call this Amber's new music because when I talk about it, I feel like I'm selling to the emperor, so that, in other words, I, I, I have huge credibility problems on a personal level, because this is not what everybody wants to hear, and I'm not surprised. I mean, if somebody had said this to me after 13 years of playing the violin by numbers, oh, wait a minute, here, 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 you should be playing by ear, why don't you do some jazz, how about your composition? I was like, who do you think you are? So that's where we are. Now, Will this change? Well, first of all, if you want to know more about it, which I would be thrilled if you do, you can go to YouTube. And some person, thank goodness, has put a whole series of lectures about how this really works. With obviously 16 to 18 minutes, is not going to do it. But there's also something else very important that's happened. And it's happened in Venezuela. So 30 years ago, a very fine musician managed to get music instruction put into low-income day care. Six days a week, sometimes 12 hours a day, music was an essential element of this. So they, so they learned to sing. I mean, it's very close to the whole day, isn't it? To go to daycare because your mother's 
just got to be out there working. And you're still not earning enough money. Well, I have trouble making this point. And the reason is that it's been documented. So that's what we want to do now. We want to show you the trailer for a documentary that they made about the limited program in Caracas, which now I think includes more than 250,000 their star is what's talking about now, who is the music director of the LA Company. Thank you. Nosotros vamos a pensar que vivimos en un barrio, en un barrio humilde que hay inseguridad. Nosotros a pesar no han dado educación. Hay muchas personas que dicen, él vive en un barrio y no le han dado educación. Era el primer día de la orquesta de cámara, entonces yo venía temprano y me dijeron, mmm, me dieron un disparo en la pierna y no pude ir. Y entonces yo llorando porque... No me dolía, me dolía la pierna, pero más me dolía que no iba a estar aquí el día ese en lo que está de cama. Si se le olvida cuando uno llega aquí, se le olvida todo, todo, todo. El profesor nos dice, toquen pero con su corazón, no con, no con la mente, con el corazón. Venezuela, nosotros estamos en este momento trabajando para un universo de beneficiarios que se calcula en 265 mil jóvenes y niños. Pero esto es apenas el comienzo. Nosotros estamos aprendiendo a tocar trompeta como para sacar nuestra familia adelante. Estamos para adelante como elefantes. La raíz para mí del problema social está en la exclusión. Entonces nosotros tenemos que luchar por incluir el mayor número, todos si es posible, incluirlo en este mundo bello, ¿verdad? Que es nuestro mundo de la música, de la orquesta, del canto, ¿verdad? De, de, del arte.